Welcome. Today we have a show on encounters that is of interest to uh, people in the United States and also all over the world, actually. We have a guest visiting us today from the country of Sierra Leone and also a uh, development specialist who works throughout Africa, mainly Western Africa, I believe. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are not only cohorts and work together for social change for women, especially in Sierra Leone, but they're good friends. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit today about the status of women in Sierra Leone. And first I would like to introduce uh, our guests. Our first guest is Jordine Hale. Jordine is a development specialist uh, that is uh, with a group called Sage Fox Consulting Group mm -hmm. based here in Amherst. And she does a lot of work in Africa. Uh, one of the places that she often visits is Sierra Leone. And our special guest today is the Honorable Marie Jallo. Uh, she is a member of the National Parliament in Sierra Leone, one of the few women in National Parliament. She's National Secretary, of, Secretary General of the Women's Congress and also a delegate to the United uh, Nations on HIV AIDS. So she holds uh, a lot of important positions and she's got a lot more important positions to hold in the future, I'm sure. So I want to start today with Jordine, with mm -hmm. uh, having, hearing a little bit about your work in Africa and then also how you met uh, Marie. Okay. I work in international development and I focus on girls and gender and child labor projects, um, although I'm beginning to learn about agriculture and how that affects women. Um, Marie and I met in 2004 on a USAID-sponsored project called the Ambassador Girls Scholarship Project. Um, and I was the monitoring and evaluation consultant hired to make sure that the money went where it was supposed to go and that these were girls and they were really going to school. Um, the program sponsored through local non-governmental organizations girls to go to their local primary school. And is that uh, the norm in African countries like Sierra Leone that girls are going to school? Or is that? It has greatly increased since 2000. Oh. We've seen a remarkable amount of girls going to school. Um, still 30% 30, um, 30 of children do not go to school. Mm. And of that 30%, the majority are girls. Mm. So there's still a big issue, but the progress has been incredible. Mm. The issue now is that they're going to school, but the classrooms have 100 150, oh, 160 children with one teacher with no textbooks. Oh. So it's school, but it's not quality education yet. So there's a need for textbooks? Oh, there's an incredible need for books of all sorts. One of the things I want to talk about throughout this uh, interview <coughs> is what the needs are. Mm -hmm. Because somebody out there may uh, mm -hmm. have, you know, resources that mm -hmm. could help you in Sierra Leone. So. Textbooks would be textbooks. one, and just books in general. Well, any books. The kids are just eager to have books in their hands. Oh. They get so excited. And how did you meet Marie? Marie and I met in 2004 on this Ambassador Girl Scholarship Project. And uh, we went to a conference in Dakar that was this opening conference, and uh, we just got along. And, and so your relationship was as a friend rather than in the development work? Well, we met at the <laughs> conference, so I guess it had a development context, um, but it was mostly over dinner and uh, laughter. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not, I wasn't her boss and she wasn't my boss, and there was no hierarchy there. Yeah. So, I think we, you told me a great story that I would love to have you tell about when you first got to, was it Freetown in Sierra Leone? It was my first night in the provinces. I had spent a uh, little time in capital Freetown staying at a very nice hotel right on the beach and it was lovely. And then we moved out to the provinces and this was in 2005 <laughs> and the war had only been over for about three years. Um, so conditions were really, really rough. 
um, and we checked into what was then the nicest hotel in McKinney, um, which is a dis uh, is a capital about two hours outside of uh, Freetown, the capital. So it's it's a small small. At that point, it was a small city. Now it's getting to be bigger, and there are beautiful hotels there now. Mm. But in 2005, the hotel, uh, well, let's just say there weren't sheets on the bed. Um, the bucket of water for washing was filled with insects. Um, no toilet seat, no screen on the window, no air conditioning, and Marie dropped me off there and said, I'll be back. And I thought, I'm not going to survive. <laughs> not going to survive. It's 100 degrees. The water is filthy. There are no sheets on the bed. The room was just unbelievable. And I wanted to go outside, but outside in the corridor were only men. And I've learned not to step into situations where there might be trouble. So I just stayed in my room. A couple hours later, Marie knocked on the door. She said, are you hungry? Said, yes, very. And she brought me to her room, and it was filled with women, filled with cousins and women and friends. And they were all eating chicken and fruit and rice. And it, I just felt like I was home. Yeah. I knew I was home at I that moment. That story. <laughs> I was where I belonged. Yeah. And then after that, we just mostly stayed with Marie's cousins. Oh. Um, and that was, that was lovely. Yeah, that, that was, was a nice introduction. Yeah. Well, Marie, so how long have you, how many times have you been to the United States? This is my second time in the United States. Oh, mm -hmm. so this is the mm -hmm. second time. Mm -hmm. I know you were here, I'll tell everyone that I met you, I think it was in March or April. 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 Mm -hmm. And I'd gotten a call, or we'd gotten a call from Jordine about, uh, to the League of Women Voters, mm -hmm. to talk, come talk to you a little bit about organizing women to, to get involved in politics. And so we came with our pamphlets and we were all set to talk about it. But I found I was much more interested in you <laughs> and your story. So, um, Tell us a little bit about growing up. First of all, tell us about Sierra Leone. Where is it? Sierra Leone is situated in the west, in West Africa. Mm -hmm. On the ocean? Yes, across the Atlantic Ocean, and a whole lot of mountain trees around Sierra Leone. Oh. And it's one of the few countries that we are, uh, gained independence 50 years ago from the British. Uh -huh. So Sierra Leone is a small country with a population of about six million. Oh. Mm. And Sierra Leone is what they call uh, cursed with resources. I read they have, well, we have blood diamonds. Gold, which is diamond, yes. bauxite. Yeah. We have a free cent, platinum, iron ore. Uh -huh. As I'm speaking to you now, we have Africa Minerals Limited. They are exploiting. Um, um, bauxite. Bauxite. I did read and bauxite. Oil. Mm -hmm. and, and oil in Sierra Leone. And oil. Yeah, iron ore. And oh, we have iron. got oil. But oil too? Oil too, yes. Mm -hmm. So wow. we, we, and we have good vegetation. Yes. Sierra Leone landscape is interesting. You have very beautiful be uh, beach uh -huh. sites all over the country, especially in Freetown. Beautiful beaches. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Every over. So Sierra Leone is a small, nice country. And it has it's mountains too, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, it, um, it means, Sierra Leone, I think, means large mountain or mountain. L Lion Mountain. Lion Mountain. Mm -hmm. So you have the mountains, rainforests, yes. and as well as the ocean, yes. beach. So and you grew we up. We have two main seasons, the dry season and the wet season. And you're right near the equator. Mm -hmm. So it's tropical. Yes. Very hot. Very, very hot. hot. And <laughs> very cold sometimes. Very cold. So yes. anything that comes there is in extremities. Oh. Very cold, very hot. Especially the, on the, weather. the mountains would be cold. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you grew up in Freetown? No. No. I came to st I came to stay in Freetown after the war, but I was I grew up in the provinces in Kamakwe Bomali district. Where is that? 
north. Uh, it's about the north of Sierra Leone. It's about 175 miles from the capital city, Frita, ah. in a suburb. Ah. Uh, where I was, uh, where I came from, is closer to Guinea than even Frita. Oh, okay. It's about Near 38 Guinea. miles to Guinea. So that's where your family went during the war. You went over the border into Guinea yes, to escape just, uh, the war. Yes, exactly. The whole family, well, everybody. My mom and my dad did did not move away, oh. and uh, my sisters were all in within the surrounding villages, going up and down, going oh. hide and seek yeah. from the from the rebels. But I managed to move away with my bike, with my only daughter by then, Edna. I have her on a motorbike because I was riding a motorbike that time. You, you went over the border on a yes, motorbike with, on with a your motorbike. daughter? Yes, on a motorbike, oh yes. And, and with my papers, all the documents I have, so that, that I know I will lose everything. That must have been really dangerous, mm -hmm. very dangerous. Yes. How old was Edna? Edna was only seven or five, five years old, I don't know, around that. Five she was six young, years, very six young. Six years old. Yeah. So, okay. Here's, I, I, I wanted to just tell everyone a little bit about Sierra Leone, and we, we do have a map that I'll show. Okay. Um, it's beautiful beach area. I went on I to look and they had the white beaches and it's just gorgeous. Um, and then all the resources, but it's one of the poorest countries in the world. So true. And with, even with these minerals, the movie Blood Diamond was about Sierra Leone. People may have seen that. I think that was out a few years ago. True. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> then also, it uh, there was a problem with deforestation at one time. I don't know whether that's it's still, still true. It's still a problem. That they did a lot of slash and burn mm -hmm, to because plant. Because of poor cultural practices and other cultural practices. Yes. So, so still have a lot of afforestation activities to be done yes. in order to reclaim the lands back. Yes. The charcoal burning and the like. And the like. Huh. Mm -hmm. Well, here's another interesting thing I learned that the United States has a unique tie to Sierra Leone because a lot there was a lot of African slave trade mm -hmm. that s left Sierra Leone and also Guinea and I guess in, along that area of western, western coast of Africa and, and brought slaves, millions who, who died on the way over mm -hmm. in that middle passage, brought slaves to the United States then when slavery was finally outlawed in this country, many went back yes. to Sierra Leone mm -hmm. and, and settled there. And even though they were from other parts of Africa, they stayed. Yes, exactly. So you have, so that's a very unique tie, and I didn't even know about that. It's so interesting, again, because in Freetown right now, we have several tribes, about 14 tribes with additional two, making it 16. Mm -hmm. So the real indigenous of Freetown Mm -hmm. are the Creoles, Creoles that are half half Western and half traditional. Uh -huh. So they were living in the protectorate at that time in uh -huh. Freetown. But we have people coming from the provinces. Those are either be Timini, Limbas, Susus, because of the links and the different slaves that came. Uh -huh. Some came from Guinea, some came from, so we have this mix. Yeah. You see me now, you know, you know, I'm not from one tribe. I'm a Limba, at the same time have a fuller background. Some have Timini background, Mindy background. So we are more or less interrelated in that country. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. Very diverse. Just to like yeah. confirm what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, let me ask you about, <coughs> you went, uh, where did you go to school? Where was your education? I went to school in a small remote area in Kamakwe, 55 miles off the capital city of Makeni, which is Bombali for the northern region, is the regional headquarter town. 55 miles off. You hardly see a vehicle during that time in that place. I mean, vehicle flying through the main road because you have a ro poor road network. Uh -huh. So I got, went to school in that small school, in that small village, up to secondary level. Secondary level, mm -hmm. okay. Then I left, uh, when I attained fifth form, you call it grade 12? Mm -hmm. uh -huh, 12. No, before I get to grade 12, uh, grade 11, to get to the fifth form, uh -huh. I had constraints. I couldn't continue my schooling. I have to stay one year to help my mom sell at home oh. because my daddy was sick at that time. So I have to sell, help my mommy sell at home to upkeep the family, not to take, talk of paying my GCO level fees. Uh -huh. I don't have to call it school certificate exam, promotional examination. Yeah. Yeah. So I have to delay one year. I only sat to the GC in 1986. Mm. So because I persevered and I wanted to get the goal of education at the end of the day, mm -hmm. I waited for one year. 
And the other year, I continued my schooling. Mm. Yes, I was selling and I was not pregnant at that moment. You were pregnant? No. No, no, not pregnant. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh. Well, um, let me ask you also, um, did you, did you, when you went to Guinea, did you go to school there or were you at, through school by then? I was through, uh, I, I, well then, when I left um, Kabakwe in 1986, in 87 I came back to McKinney uh -huh. to attend schooling. Uh -huh. but then I was staying with my uncle, my uncle could not pay for me. I have another crisis, but I, st I was still determined to go to school, so I was staying with my elder sister. So after school, I go back and sell for my sister household condiments so that we would to augment to pay my school fees. Oh. So while I was in Form 5 again, trying to see this whole level, I got pregnant along the way. Oh. So I was with the pregnancy, innocently I didn't know I was pregnant. Mm -hmm. I didn't know, I don't even know how to figure out that this person is pregnant because I was in my teens. Age 16, I had my baby. Mm. And is that, the, is that usual? That, that girls have babies young? Yes, 14, 15, 16, up to 17 years old. And are 18. they married by then? No, no. they are not married. <coughs> okay. Somebody that's more mature than you will come and like s seduce you and mm -hmm. that's... Who takes care of the baby then? Your family? You have you the problem, your family, yourself and everybody. So I have to, but my case was different because I didn't realize I was pregnant until after five months. Oh. So I kept the baby and I was determined to sit my O-level. Uh -huh. So I kept the baby until I sat to the GCO levels. I left school. Three months to four months later, I had my baby. Uh -huh. So as soon as I had the baby, I left the baby with my elder sister, oh. my, my aunt, and everybody was taking care of her collectively. Mm -hmm. So I was breastfeeding her while going to the teacher training college. Mm. I did my hair teacher certificate. Good, so yeah. during the war, uh, I had this teacher training certificate and I was working with an international organization called Action Aid. So uh, called during what, what was it? Action Aid International, UK-based charity. Mm -hmm. oh, Action Aid is Action UK Aid, based. I was a community development mm -hmm. oh. worker. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. and this was during the war? During the war, yes. Oh. Exactly during the war. The war started in 1991. I started work in 1993, wow. two years later. So I was given a motorbike <laughs> as a community field worker. So I did a it on the motorbike for seven and a half years. You just drove around to villages? All over, the villages and even to the nearest capital city, uh, the, help, uh, the district at Kota Town. And McKinney. what were you doing in the villages? You were doing um, development services to poor people during the war. Oh my goodness. So I was like, we were working, actually it was working on education, agriculture, health issues, yeah. general development initiative. Uh -huh. So that's how I became a development specialist. Oh. So that's the way, the, during the war, um, Kamakwe was attacked uh -huh. in 1995, uh -huh. where I'm staying, where I was staying that time. So don't have time to go home and pack. So I just move away with my daughter. I just pick up my daughter. Oh, and that's put her on the motorbike and went to get and left. Mm -hmm. Very dangerous. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can hardly even imagine that here. Yes. I, it's hard to imagine that we are, we were attacked twice in 1995, 96, and 1998. 1998. Finally, I went to Guinea. I yeah. was in Guinea until 2000 when I came back to Freetown. Well, Since the then, I started staying in Freetown. Ah, mm -hmm. the the Civil War was from 1991 till 2002. Yes. And then that was the end of the Civil War Officially, there. Officially, yes. Officially. Mm -hmm. um, and the, it was a colony of, of England, right? Yes. At four hundred or hundred and something years. Yes, yes. Um, so well, that's why Marie, you know, they have the, an exam that their education system is based on the British system. Mm -hmm. So you have to pass your yes, O-levels. Yeah. yeah, I heard the O-levels and that's right. in the British. Before you go to university. Yeah. Before you go to university and they're very stringent. Yeah. If you get five, so I have, I have to see Five levels? Mm -hmm. Five O-levels. Wow. Um, so I know you've got a master's degree as well. Mm -hmm. And a first degree too. And yes, and so you've got your education. Now, let's shift for just a minute <laughs> to what made you so determined and dedicated to help the women in Sierra Leone. Where did that come from? As a teenage girl growing up, while growing up, I, I was determined to say, oh me, I'm coming from a poor, a modest family. Uh -huh. I want to make sure that, first of all, I valued education. Education. And my, who gave me the main, the, that, that aspiration was my late dad. Your father? My father died 10 years ago during the war. Oh. 
my father was so interested in educating people all over the place. Uh -huh. He was not educated, but because he had an exposure, Western exposure, yes. so he, he admired um, education. Uh -huh. So he was able to put me in school. Uh -huh. We are only two girls in my family by then. So my elder sister was at school. Me too, I was at school. But interestingly, I was so fast. You were fast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in the primary level, I did five years. <laughs> oh my goodness. I went to class one when I was five. By the time I get to class three, I have double promotion. Oh. So I did five years instead of seven years at primary level. Oh, so you just so got I was extremely fast. Mm -hmm. Smart and Smart, fast. Yes. <laughs> so when I got to secondary school, up to that is what happened to all Sierra Leonean children, most of them that come from poor families. Oh. From primary to secondary, to up to basic secondary, uh, ninth grade, your parents will be able to pay. Oh. But going to the senior high, that's, that's where the challenge is. It's expensive. Sometimes you, your, people, your, your parents cannot afford. Oh. Other people might come in or sometimes that, that's the end of your schooling. Oh. So being a teenager from that background, looking at my parents' situation, and I said, no, I need to move from this level and leap forward. And as a teenager, I became pregnant innocently. Yeah. So I said I need to fight this cause for all women of Africa for and women. women of the world as well. Yes. So what I did was to say, hey, we really have to push on, no matter the challenges. So imagine I have to drop out of school, out of nothing, sit down, in, in, uh, sit down for one year without going to school, just to let, to, to at least see how best I can be able to continue my dream so that I will not drop on the wayside. Yeah. Because before this time, if you become pregnant, in the 80s in Sierra Leone, you just, you stop, just school. stop school because the society will yell at you. Everybody will be, wo will be just disown you, yeah. thinking that that's the worst thing you've done out of marriage. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And a lot of my colleagues dropped out of school as a result of that. Mm -hmm. But I said, I need to move on. I have something, an inner drive within me. You do. I said, Marie, you have to move on. And, so I, and I kept pressing on. Kept going so to school. Yes. And then so how did you I get into the higher teacher certificate? Uh -huh. I had my five O levels, but I couldn't go to the university because I didn't have anybody to pay for me. Oh. So but when I went to the Catholic school, there was a Catholic training college, it was free. So that's why I got a higher teacher certificate. Oh. And I went to work with Action Aid International. Uh -huh. So five years, um, 10 years later after the war, I came there and I pursued my degree uh -huh. in community development and education. The master's degree I got in extension education and rural sociology. So that was the way I went. In, in sociology? Yes, yeah, so rural what, sociology. That's, that's what, what I my did. background is. That's what sociology. I did. Sociology. Yes. <laughs> Great. Oh. We've got that in common. Um, yes. so how did you get into politics? So coming to that is a long way. That's the driveway I'm showing now. So I, and in 2000, before I left Sierra Leone during the war in 1998, I started working with few village women and young girls. That we need, as a community-based organization, uh -huh. that we need to do something. We need to move from where we are. I started teaching them how to do gara, how to do soap from 1990s. Gara is tie-dyeing? Tie -dyeing. Oh, the t beautiful tie-dyeing, yes. tie dye like this one that I'm wearing yes, now. This yes. is tie-dye, sample oh. of this. Beautiful. Tie-dye and soap making, local soap. soap. Oh. Because during the rains, it's expensive and hardly rich. And the, the imported soap is expensive. Oh. So that's why we train the women locally how to make their make own soap. Mm -hmm. So they got these skills. And I said, no, I'm not going to stop this skill here in this village. It was uh, like mem about 40 women we started with. After the war, during the war, I was still working with them, networking with them, helping them, training them, building their capacity. Then I moved into Guinea. Then after Guinea, I said, no, this woman will have to do something. I moved, I, did, I developed a, a vocational training center oh, in Freetown. A training center, okay. In where? Freetown? In Freetown. In the capital. To train ex-combatants, people that we are. Oh, ex-combatants. Combatants. Oh. Those that we are in the fighting yeah. forces uh -huh. and other single parent girls like myself. Yes. So wherever, because during the war, a whole lot of problems happened. Poor children, yes. ages below 18, got pregnant. By, by rebels, oh, they by other men. Were they yes. raped? They had children or raped. Yeah, or or, or raped. gang raped. Yeah. So I opened a school for them. Ah. So that school went on. Then I finally took the school again to come and pray in my hometown. Ah. And as I'm speaking to you now, I've established a school in my constituency at the same time in Makeni and at the same time in 
Kamalu, three places. That you have school. a school? Oh, it's vocational at school, training school. Voc voc vocational training. training school. Mm -hmm. So train middle-aged girl, sorry, girls. Sorry, girls that stop at middle-level school. Oh, for girls, mm -hmm. okay. For girls and boys or whoever. Uh -huh. Well, how did this lead you into running for office? Yes, when I came back in 2000, I said, no, what? And the background about the North, although I see this paper that was written about me, uh -huh. most of it uh, were true, some other people, you know, dogs came, wild vehicles came, they wanted to kidnap me. It were people, not dogs. Oh, people came. That. People came to kidnap me, that was mm. very true. In the Northern region where I'm coming from, it's difficult. To run? To run for public offices because of our culture, our religious upbringing, and other social factors. Mm -hmm. The woman in the north and other parts of Sierra Leone, in the east of Sierra Leone, are to be seen and not to be heard in most cases. Ah, yes. But with time, through a lot of trainings, I became interested and said, no, this status quo must change as a social change agent. Mm -hmm. I said, and in making the difference, I must be part of the, the change process. Oh, yes, that's very that's true. That's how I came into politics. <laughs> that's good. I, will, I, I opened up an organization called um, Bombali District Women's Network. Women's Network. It was funded by ENSYS, a group, a UK-based charity ah. that supported... What is it? In 2000. ENSYS. ENSYS. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. It's a UK-based char charity that supported mm -hmm. women. Mm -hmm. No, people mm -hmm. and youth, women and... It, they like civil society organization. Mm -hmm. So I was hap I was heading this civil society organization. What is the name of the organization? Bombali District Women's Network. Network, a network of women of the 13 chiefdoms of Bombali. Uh -huh. okay. So I brought them together and said, you know what? At that time, it was closer to the local council elections in 2004. There was a local council election. Mm -hmm. And we only had, I think, two candidates. Mm -hmm. So um, NC sponsored us to reach out more women so that they would come out to the north to become um, councillors and some become parliamentarians. Mm -hmm. Then we tried in, in Kabbalah, we were able to get about 11 women mm -hmm. coming up for councillorship. Mm -hmm. in, uh, in Bombali, we now have a deputy mayor who is a woman. Good. Yes, from this same project. Uh -huh. And we have a lot of women now, over six or eight of them being 10 of the 12 of them, I cannot tell you now, definitely the correct figure. But we have quite a lot of women in the local council. Yes, like that would be like select board or board, yeah, the council, city council, yeah, city council, and, and the district council. Uh huh. So we have those two. And good, that's a good starting place. Yes. And these, then let me I just interrupt here for one second. Please the do. districts that Marie is talking about are very conservative. Uh huh. Very rural, very difficult to get to. Mm -hmm. ah. The roads purely Muslim. The roads are not oh. accessible. They're Muslim Very much mus Muslim communities mm -hmm. and, and very remote. Oh. Yes. So for these women, it's, oh, it's, it's huge. just that much more yeah, of an obstacle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in 2004, Koinadugu district didn't have any woman councillor. Bombali had few, and like by mm -hmm. four. In 2007, I said, you know what? I have to run. <laughs> if we want more women to be parliamentarians and be councillors, I think I have to step down from my civil yes. society activism and go into... You have to do it yourself. Do it yourself. Uh -huh. And it's better done if you do it yourself. Yes. So what I did in 2006, I told the women around, I said, I'm going to run for 2007 election. Who oh, are here? And I tell you, I'm the second and the first youngest female member of parliament in that region I'm coming from, the district, Bombali district. Yeah, yeah. This is a, such a so great story. <laughs> so now you're working to get other women. Yes, to trying run. to other so women have come. Yeah. Now we have a deputy mayor being female. Uh -huh. Thanks to the president we have right now, uh -huh. who also sees have a soft spot for women Good. to be empowered. Good. He has given us a 30% uh, quota uh -huh. so that women should have equality, 30% representation in parliament. As I'm speaking to you now, we have 14% of women. Yes. 12 to 14 percent of women. But it's increasing. It's increasing, yes. Yeah. Before this time, it was lower than this. Uh -huh. So the, the, the in Bombali district, we are two female MPs. Uh -huh. And it is interesting to know that the two female MPs come from our village, Kamakwe. I mean, we have two female yeah. MPs from the district out from of nine MPs. Great. So we are making <laughs> positive strides. Part. It takes it's a So that's steps. how I became interested in becoming uh -huh. politicians. Uh -huh. We need to 
change the status quo. Women need to be empowered. Women need to take the lead role. Yeah. I'm not going to stop where I am by the grace of God. Mm -hmm. I'll move steps further. You will move if forward. I, I, support, I know you will. I will <laughs> because it takes strength and courage. And uh -huh. I mean, you go through a lot of in intimidation. I mean, like this paper yeah. before me, I was intimida intimidated by 500 men. Yeah. When I wanted to run in 2007, yeah, yeah, I know. they attacked me yeah. and they did everything. Yeah. But I was there. I said, I'm not running away. If I would die, let me die as a hero. hero. Yeah. Trying to change the status quo. Good, good for you. That would go on history. <laughs> so that's how I came into politics, and I'm happy because I'm in politics. Well, we're almost out of time. Wow. See, this goes by so quickly. That was so fast. <laughs> uh, no, and there's so there, many more there's stories. There's so many Marie more stories. Well, Marie's going to be here tomorrow and the next day, and then we'll be going back to Sierra Leone, but one of the things I wanted to just mention is that, Jordeen, there is a foundation here, mm -hmm. and would you just tell what that is, is okay. helping women in Sierra There's Leone? There's an organization, a foundation called Mountain Top, mm -hmm. and we work to empower women in Sierra Leone. Um, we have a number of objectives. One is to help uh, Marie and other women with leadership trainings and leadership issues. Mm -hmm. Um, we're also very interested in women's health. Um, as Marie mentioned, girls become pregnant without even knowing they're pregnant. Mm -hmm. um, and the issue of female genital mutilation is still quite enormous in Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. So we're working to empower women to, to take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're also working with girls in the Diamond Mining District to oh. help sponsor them in schools. Ah, wonderful. So we've got a few different objectives, but they're all around women <laughs> and girls and getting s some power. Yes. S not, you know, empowered. Yeah, it's empowerment. A, it's, a, it's a hard word because mm -hmm. it can mean a lot of different things, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. getting women educated and knowledgeable about their own health. Well, I want to thank both of you so much for being here. This is um, the first time I met you. I thought what you have to show women is the determination, the courage to keep going, to be persistent. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm telling you folks, she may be president of Sierra Leone one day. I could mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> She is uh, really on her path. So uh, <laughs> we really appreciate you both being here. And uh, good luck. And if you're interested in helping in any way, uh, we'll have a couple of email addresses. You can write to Jordine mm -hmm. and Marie. Mm -hmm. And Mountaintop Foundation is here, uh, headed by Jordine's involved, Marina mm -hmm. Goldman, and Heather White. Mm -hmm. And we'll be hearing more about them, too. So thank you both for being here. Thank and uh, we hope that this has been interesting and challenging for you all to get involved and, and help us. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you, Cynthia. Thank you very much. Love